Welcome to Steel Talks, a podcast by Arsenal Mitchell, hosted by Applied Futurist Tom Cheesry. Tom is going to be talking to members of our global leadership team about topics that will shape our future. In today's episode, Tom chats to Lauren Plasma, Chief Marketing Officer for our European SAC products business. They discuss the steel intensive nature of the energy transition, the support we are offering to our renewable energy customers, and the opportunities the seismic energy shift presents for our business. Hello, Laurent. Uh, thank you so much for joining me. Um, please, could you introduce yourself? Yes. Hi, Tom. Thanks. Um, so, um, my name is Laurent Plasman. I'm the CMO um, for the industry scope within the Flat Europe organization. Fantastic. So, listen, there's, a, there's a, an obvious topic to start with here. How is Europe's green energy transition progressing and, and how are we seeing that in terms of demand for steel? Well, um, the... The, the whole um, growth of renewables in, in uh, Europe is, is really accelerating. Of course, the uh, ambitions are set very high uh, by, by the European Commission. Um, and uh, there is here and there, of course, some questions on how fast it can go. But when we, re- when we really look at the facts and the numbers compared to a couple of years ago, it's quite impressive. Huh? So if you look at solar, um, 2023, we saw 50, 60, uh, 65 gigawatt uh, installed for only for solar uh, farms, and that was a couple of years ago was less than 10 gigawatt. And the projection is, and it's pretty sure, and it's probably not even the higher projections range that this will grow to 120 gigawatt per year in 2030. Uh, and this is then an equivalent of about two million tons of uh, steel equivalent demand. Looking at wind, it's um, yeah quite similar. Um, uh, when a few years ago it was also less than 10 gigawatt, now we should reach 15 to 20 gigawatt, and this will reach uh, 30, 40 gigawatt at least, also by 2030, um, to reach a target of 500 gigawatt installed by by that period, and that is then an, an equivalent of four to five million tons of steel. When a couple of years ago it was more like one to 1.5 million tons. Wow, that's an incredible increase. Um, can we break that down? Because those are, those are enormous numbers in terms of the amount of steel required. What sort of steel demand are we talking about from, say, a wind turbine or a solar array? Yes, so on, on solar, there are really uh, different solutions available, uh, depending also on the need for the corrosion protection. So uh, for us, the value proposition that we have on our uh, specialized product, which is called Magnelis, which is a zinc magnesium coating, um, is uh, that we have the best corrosion protection with this product compared to more classic uh, solutions like post galvanizing or uh, a more uh, regular hot dip galv uh, product. Um, so um, on, on the wind side, you're more looking at uh, heavy plate. And there, depending on the, uh, if you go onshore or offshore, or depending on the size of the uh, of, of the turbine, uh, you may look at uh, also different sizes of heavy plate. And there, um, it really uh, depends on, on, on the industrial footprint, who can reach these uh, types of uh, heavy plate. But uh, we are pretty well placed to at least play uh, a good role in the, in the, in the mid-size position. Uh, of this uh, of this market just go back to that that sort of that galvanizing that magnelis product there you know, what does that mean in terms of lifespan because this this you know, clearly one of the ways that we reduce the amount of of of, of the carbon footprint is to reduce to increase the lifespan of everything we put out there you know, what, what are we talking about in terms of lifespan for something like that on a solar Yeah, we array? start getting um, a request and also we are able to give um, uh, guarantees for lifespans up to uh, 30, 40 years. Uh, and this is uh, especially wow. for a big part of the market, uh, extremely important on the risk management of such a, a wind farm, uh, a solar farm. Uh, depending, of course, on the aggressivity on, of the environment where, where it's being built. Um, but this is uh, for sure also after a number of um, bad experiences of uh, of the industry of the, our customers or customer of customers uh, where um, such farms have been heavily uh, corroded and then the whole investment goes to waste. So this is certainly um, 
uh, very proposition um, that is has a very uh, yeah, good um, resonance on the market um, uh, and, and is more and more um, appreciated. In terms of the the wind turbines then, there's obviously a variety of different locations they're going to be placed in. What's the variance in terms of the sort of the amount of steel going into a turbine if we're talking about something that's on land or or offshore? Yes, yeah, so that's quite a multiplier that you can see, and this is also driving the whole steel demand. So in on onshore you look you would be looking at more like a fifty tons per megawatt. And then you can have uh, uh, also, the megawatts are then more more restricted, um, but offshore you would quickly go to 200 to 300 ton per megawatt, and there you start to have wow. uh, yeah uh, the giants up to 15 megawatt towers uh, that that are are targeted uh, that are already possible, um, and then a second step or another step would be to go to um, floating towers uh, that we understand would have even a higher steel intensity. Uh, than than uh, regular towers where where you have foundations. Given the the objective is to cut carbon emissions, that's the whole point of this this green energy transition. What can be done about the emissions of, of steel itself? And we, we've talked a little bit about how um, increasing the lifespan um, does that. But can you do things with the design and, and the technology of the steel itself? Yes. So first of all, um, it's all. Uh, will be developing in parallel but at the same time of course the industry is also uh, working hard to to decarbonize the footprint and that will then also become available in, in the coming years for the renewable uh, demand but already today as ArcelorMittal at least we have a proposal to um, uh, use lower carbon steel yeah? and this is a flow that we have uh, or a setup that we have via our uh, Arslometa Europe affiliate um, uh, industrial, which provides us a low carbon uh, slab, which we then can use in our plate mill in Gijon. Uh, and this has been recognized and we have an agreement with uh, a major player like Vestas to start using this in, in a project that's, that's being rolled out uh, with Baltic power. Um, so that is one. Another very important one, then you come to solar on the Magnelis part, is that uh, a Magnelis coating is, is per se a, a lower environmental uh, footprint because you, lose, you use less um, uh, coating uh, material. And secondly, the, the, our, our technical commercial teams are working hard with the customers to also provide new design solution based on higher strength steels. So just the fact that you combine this uh, with um, higher sank steels can also make that you use uh, up to 10, 15 and even 20 percent less steel, which is on itself also uh, a, a carbon gain. So it's a combination of um, yeah, use, replace with uh, X-carb steel when you can. Uh, and uh, redesign with higher strength to use less steel and this this together can you can have gains up to 70 80 percent of, of uh, carbon reduction and does that same mathematics apply to something like a wind turbine are there opportunities there for, for redesign with a higher strength steel um, it's a bit less uh, the case there is it's, it's really the case more uh, of of the size of the of the plates and there we we would really focus uh, now on the on the substrate, which means that we have this uh, big gain that we can bring on the uh, on the X-carb slabs. The bigger slabs, less welding. Bigger slabs mean less welding uh, as well. And this is uh, this is uh, let's say independent of being at uh, X-carb or not. But uh, yes, the the main reason for uh, the industry looking for these uh, huge uh, plates. Is, is, uh, is, is indeed efficiency in the manufacturing process. It all helps. Now, in terms of what can be done to accelerate this, you, know, you, you set out an incredible picture there in terms of the, this, the speed of the transition that's happened already and the, the, the level of ambition for the targets going forward. But it's not just about um, steel companies. It's not just about the, the customers building these 
these energy arrays, you know, what else needs to be done to, in, to accelerate the transition? Well, a big part is also that we're looking at policymakers and, and prescribers. Um, on, one thing is to have um, um, politics and the European Commission and member states uh, put very high ambitions, which is, uh, which is good. Huh? We, we, we all uh, can subscribe to that. Uh, but um, there's also uh, not only 2030 or 2040, there is now. And what we are saying, we can already work now. But for that, we need concrete um, concrete rules that, that put us in the right direction. That means uh, concretely, for instance, uh, tendering for, for wind farms. Um, yeah, it's time to put very clear non-price factors in there. Uh, to um, incentivize uh, the, the deciders that uh, it makes sense to buy part of it uh, already on DCARP when it's available, and it is available, yeah? just to, to make one example. Beyond wind and solar, do you see other shifts in demand or, or growth in demand for steel? Yes. There's for sure a number of other um, uh, trends going on that, that are emerging or, or are already partly there. Huh? The, the, the biggest ones in there is uh, what, what is happening on the grid for hydrogen or for CO2. Um, and on this is interesting because you see um, notably for uh, the classic line pipe producers, which is also our customers, um, where they have been heavily into oil and gas. Uh, now they, they see shifts coming to yeah, pure renewables, uh, also transport then of, of uh, this renewable energy uh, through line pipe. Uh, this then um, requires partly uh, yeah, specific grades, new R&D, uh, which we are also supporting. Uh, but these, uh, these grids, and apparently notably now the most, uh, the one that is more emerging is, is CO2. Uh, for carbon uh, capture and storage um, and then the hydrogen uh, what is called the backbone hydrogen grid that will come in the coming uh, five or ten years is then will then also be an important support for the demand there here you're talking probably about uh, several hundred thousand tons maybe not millions but it's an important part at least for europe um, yeah, on this sector uh, to uh, compensate the, re the reduction of uh, oil and gas. It's an enormous technical challenge as well, transporting hydrogen. That must require, like you say, some, some serious R&D. Yeah, there's serious R&D. There's also views on uh, how to combine this more with, with the classic. Uh, but uh, indeed, it's, it's, it's a real question on, on, uh, on the technical R&D side. You mentioned the oil and gas industry there. Is that somewhere that we're sort of you know, counter to the to the increase in renewables demand we're seeing a, a decline in demand for steel um, on the pure oil and gas at least in the in the in the in the scope of the perimeter more in europe there's uh, certainly a decline over the last five uh, five or seven years um, but we see that um, this is then compensated or will be more than compensated by the, the demand that's uh, then growing on the wind side. Um, yeah, and this, this then uh, has been rather quick after two, three years to, to, to be compensated and, and further growing. Yeah. Fantastic. Thank you, Laurent.